Welcome, viewers, to CHP Talks uh, for another edition. And we're privileged to have today with us Major Russ Cooper. He is the founder, board chair, president, and CEO of C3RF, which is the Canadian Citizens for Charter Rights and Freedoms. Uh, Major Cooper is retired from both the Royal Canadian Air Force and Air Canada. In his military career, he was a decorated CF-18 combat pilot, and he served in several staff positions as a director of major capital acquisition projects. In the civilian aviation sector, he complemented service as an international airline pilot with national responsibilities in the field of post-9-11 civil aviation security. He's published internationally in this latter area, and he's now fully retired from his follow-on career as a human factors engineer and a Transport Canada flight test pilot delegate, and he's pursuing an abiding interest in the preservation of fundamental Canadian charter rights. Uh, this latter pursuit has been prompted by his sense that these rights, hard won by the sacrifice of Canadians past, are under attack and are on the verge of being lost. And it's uh, just a real privilege to have you uh, join us today, Major Cooper. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks, Rob. Uh, great, great to be here. Yeah. So when, uh, just before we start talking, we want to talk about Afghanistan today and your, your comments and uh, uh, perspective on that. But before we do that, when did you start C3RF? I know uh, I met you several years ago, and uh, just about when did you start that? That was in the uh, the start of 2017, and that uh, that was motivated by motion M103 that was uh, coming before a, a parliamentary vote in March of um, uh, 2017. So that's when we uh, basically started with a handful of people, uh, six six to ten folks, and now we're up to about 40,000. Oh well, well, I know you uh, you put out some tremendous articles about uh, the attacks on our freedom, the things that Canadians should be concerned about. Uh, in these days, uh, and certainly the last few months have been uh, a long and uh, desperate slide into uh, a combination of tyranny and anarchy, and that's a bad combination. That's but, incredible. Uh, today, we want to look around on the other side of the globe, uh, Afghanistan, and uh, just to get, as a military person, uh, your perspective uh, what went wrong? Today, uh, many Canadians, myself included, many of our members are very concerned about the uh, civilians there, as well as uh, Canadian uh, citizens there. We have still uh, some military people, embassy staff, and the United States has a lot of people there who are under attack by the Taliban in, in what, for many of us, came as a surprising turn of events. Uh, maybe take us back to the beginning and uh, how and why did we get involved? Should we have gotten involved in Afghanistan and why are we uh, experiencing this trouble today? Yeah, this is a catastrophe. And um, I must say up front uh, at the start of the whole thing, I think we did the right thing. Remember we had 9-11, we were attacked uh, on our own soil, on Western soil. Uh, 28 uh, Canadians, I believe, died in the, uh, in the, uh, the Twin Tower attack. And uh, so... Responding to that attack was, uh, we were compelled to do so. And initially I thought we did, um, we did things right. The Americans in particular did things right. They sent in the CIA. Uh, they did a superb job of organizing the Northern Alliance uh, resistance against the Taliban to uh, basically uh, take the country over and, um, and um, kick the Taliban out. It was a fantastic success. Happened in a matter of six months. That should have been um, end of story. That should have been the objective to get rid of the Taliban and secure. And uh, the, uh, the actual objective was Al-Qaeda in the first place. And they, they escaped uh, through mountain passes into places like Iran and uh, Iraq uh, subsequent. So the object objective in Afghanistan had been uh, obtained. The mistake, <clears throat> the mistake was uh, the fact that our generals, our politicians, uh, the people in charge did not un truly understand the threat. When they were responding to the, uh, the physical attack of 9-11 and they went to war, they did the right thing. But in staying, they did the wrong thing because they did not understand the mindset of the enemy that they were facing. They believed that they could uh, throw in a couple of uh, McDonald outlets, build some schools, um, uh, uh, start some gender, gender study programs in universities in Kabul and, uh, and society would, um, would all of a sudden, we would build a new society we would bring uh, Afghanistan into mo modernity. 
and uh, it would be a, a, a plus plus all the way around. We failed to uh, recognize uh, uh, the mindset of, uh, of the people of, of Afghanistan, uh, what motivates them, what their belief system is, what their value system is all about. And because we, uh, we misread that, we basically spent 20 years there uh, wasting our time. And we can see now that uh, all is lost. All that blood, all that treasure, it's all lost in a matter of a weekend. From a Friday to a Monday, it's all gone. Now we have, I believe it's 10,000 Americans who are stranded outside the airport gates uh, trying to get out. Uh, the Biden administration uh, failed to follow through on Trump's uh, drawdown uh, plan, uh, which saw the drawdown happening in the May time frame, which is at the start of the fighting season, at the uh, when everyone's still up in the winter uh, in the winter habitats. Uh, instead, he shut down Bagram Air Base totally. It's gone, so it can't be used to get people out. And they decided to pull everything out in, a, in, in this time frame, which is the height of the fighting season. When, when every uh, mujahideen is uh, in the field with uh, with his weapon, yeah, this is totally irresponsible. All is lost, and this is a huge <clears throat> catastrophe that can probably get a lot worse from here on in. No, it's uh, it's so tragic to think of the people, especially well, you know, of course, our uh, citizens uh, and soldiers, and and the U.S. citizens and soldiers, but but the people of Afghanistan who some of whom, uh, you know, helped us a great deal, many, many of them uh, sacrificially risking their lives. And up until recently, uh, it looked like that had been a worthwhile risk. They had, you know, risked their lives, but in order to create a better society, and now they're being left to their own devices. I mean, Canada has agreed to take uh, refugees in who are uh, trying to escape the retribution and uh, slaughter uh, of the Taliban. But uh, how are we going to do that? And the prime minister seemed to be fumbling the other day when he said, well, you know, and we're closing our embassy, but somehow we're still going to get these people into our country. What are they going to do? Ask the Taliban for uh, an exit uh, visa? Like, uh, you know, it's people hanging onto airplanes and falling to their deaths. I mean, all this stuff is just horrendously uh, tragic and and uh, it's the kind of thing that you don't ever want to even hear well, about. I don't, yeah, I don't know how he can, uh, the Prime Minister is saying that they're looking at, at taking 20,000 out of Afghanistan. I don't know what he's talking about because uh, that 20,000, where that's coming from, I understand they're bringing airports or aircraft are, are landing in Ottawa now with, uh, with, with uh, so-called refugees on board. But I don't think those refugees are coming from Afghanistan. I think they're coming from other uh, uh, displacement camps uh, throughout the Middle East. I, I, I don't know how he's going to get those people out um, uh, of Kabul proper. Yeah, yeah. Well, great empires in the past have uh, come up short uh, trying to uh, do something in Afghanistan. I, I remember in our lifetimes, the Russians uh, tried to attack Afghanistan, and uh, they really were driven out in uh, humiliation. Um, and and I think that was a, a surprise to them because they were such a, at the time they were a very strong, uh, you know, dictatorship. They could sort of, you know, set their goals and usually achieve them, but not in Afghanistan. It's uh, notable that uh, they were as unsuccessful in uh, subjugating Af Afghanistan as we were. But uh, at least they uh, they managed to get out okay. They uh, they had a be much better plan, and they uh, uh, they got all their equipment, all their personnel out without uh, this this kind of consternation. So so what do you think it is about the uh, mentality, the the men who are in, you know, Al Qaeda, the Taliban, uh, who uh, you know are manning these uh, grenade launchers and and whatever they have, uh, what? What drives them, and and why is it that we in the West don't seem to understand, uh, you know, their their passion and their willingness to die on the battlefield? I think it's all. Um, it's um, if if you look at, and I, I wrote about this back in 19, uh, 2017. I, I wrote about this um, uh, because when Motion M103 was coming through, uh, it was it was promulgated on the basis that. Um, Islam is a religion of peace, um, and uh, uh, a lot of other narratives that um, uh, just aren't true. When you when you look at 
Islam and what motivates uh, the Mujahideen uh, a soldier in the field, you're looking at, um, at a system that is based on Sharia law. Uh, Sharia law, and this is, this is quite important because the, uh, the new ruler of uh, Afghanistan, who, by the way, was in Guantanamo up until 2014, when uh, Obama released him in exchange for um, Sergeant uh, Bo Bergdahl, uh, this new leader of Afghanistan is saying that uh, for us not to worry because everyone will be treated in accordance with Islamic law. Wow. Well, Islamic law is Sharia law. And it's not like uh, any legal system that we have. We have a common law system basically uh, based on the Magna Carta from 800 years ago. <laughs> Uh, Sharia law is, uh, is something that goes back um, uh, centuries and centuries and, um, and incorporates um, a golden rule, but not a golden rule like, uh, like the Christian golden rule. Uh, our golden rule is to uh, treat everybody as you would uh, have them treat uh, as you, you would treat yourself. Uh, the golden rule in, uh, in Islam under Sharia law is that there are Muslims and there are non-Muslims. And the golden rule applies to the Muslims, but the, when it comes to non-Muslims, um, it just doesn't work that way. It's not codified that way. And, and, and what we have is another aspect of Sharia law, which is, uh, is incorporated within the, that corpus of the law, is the concept of holy war and jihad. Uh, holy war and jihad uh, are basically told to the uh, Mujahideen as the highest form of service to, uh, to one's God and to one's religion. So high that uh, if you die in, uh, while, uh, uh, while in the executing uh, jihad, uh, you can be guaranteed that you're going to be put first in the list to go to paradise and, and have all the, uh, all the ample uh, benefits of, of par paradise at your, uh, at your disposal. So this type of uh, mindset where Holy war, jihad, all religion for uh, uh, for Allah is uh, is foremost in the mind of the uh, of the uh, of the Mujahideen soldier, and that's the kind of mindset that um, we uh, never chose to appreciate. We never we never chose to re understand that mindset. I, I've always likened that mindset to uh, um, kamikaze. When you look at World War II and you look at the kamikaze uh, mindset, you're looking at people who are willing to get into aircraft, fully loaded up with bombs, and uh, the aircraft was a bomb itself, and fly into uh, carriers, cruisers, and uh, battleships. Uh, that kind of divine wind uh, uh, fighting concept is what is what we're dealing with, but we never took the time to understand that that was uh, what we're dealing with. Yeah, <clears throat> and then uh, certainly... Uh... You know, in our culture, we, we have so many nuances in terms of uh, human rights and uh, treatment of our fellow citizens, uh, especially, I think, in terms of uh, gender uh, equality um, and the respect for women and girls. And, uh, you know, in, in the past, I think we even had a, a, a better, <laughs> you know, uh, approach towards the honoring women and girls as those who uh deserve protection and that men were to uh be protectors and and so on in uh, the mm -hmm. world of afghanistan and especially before uh, the u.s and Can canadian intervention there i think uh, women i mean we we saw horrendous things uh that were exposed during the time when uh u.s forces were, were in there and canadian forces in terms of uh, women being you know stoned uh you know, beaten for, uh, for various things, of course, uh, female genital mutilation, and uh, just the way that they were treated or uh, unable to, uh, they, they certainly <clears throat> did not, were not uh, treated as having equal rights <clears throat> as uh, men. And that's uh, no doubt the case today. I heard the other day or this morning, I heard about a woman being shot by the Taliban for not wearing a burqa, for instance. Yes. And uh, so, so we can probably expect, you know, a return to the dark ages in terms of uh, women's rights and, and just human rights in general. Well, here's the problem. Uh, our human rights code, uh, basically the modern code comes down to us from the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights in 1948, I believe. 
Now, the uh, is Islamic, uh, the Organization of Islamic uh, uh, Cooperation, which comprises about 56 uh, Islamic states plus Palestine as a as a observer observer state. Uh, they um, have never really uh, liked that uh, the UN uh, Declaration of Human Rights. And what they did was they came up in 1990 with their own declaration. It was called the Cairo De Declaration on Islamic Human Rights. Uh, in that declaration, the Cairo Declaration, in uh, in chapters 20, articles 24, 25, I believe, they uh, they they state quite uh, flatly that um, all human rights in Islam will be based on Sharia. So here we have that the concept of Sharia coming into um, any kind of human rights um, situation within an Islamic state. Afghanistan has just declared itself an Islamic emirate. Uh, which means that it's uh, fully uh, going to be in compliance with uh, Sharia law. And here's my worry, is that Sharia law, besides uh, the way it uh, treats uh, Muslim women as second-class citizens, when you look at um, non-Muslim women, you have a totally different situation because non-Muslim women, under the tenets of Sharia law, uh, can be, if they're, if they're taken in war, in, in battle, which the fall of Kabul certainly was, uh, Sharia law dictates that these um, uh, these captured women, uh, their marriages are are immediately annulled, and they become uh, they they become uh, slaves, sex or otherwise, of those who take charge of them. So we saw this with ISIS uh, when ISIS was uh, roaming the plains of Syria and Iraq uh, a short time ago. We can see the same thing developing here, and I'm afraid what we have is we have thousands of Western women are, who are in this, this particular situation. So this is not a good thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. certainly. Um, very, very concerning. <clears throat> do you have any uh, advice if the prime minister were to call you up and say, what should we do now? I mean, we, uh, he and, of course, uh, President Biden, that's kind of the worst case scenario I can imagine is having uh, Trudeau on this side of the border and Joe Biden on the other side. But but if he were to ask you advice, uh, obviously, there's no simple solution. There's no solution that's going to save every life. Uh, but what would you suggest, uh, first of all, for this current situation in Afghanistan? And secondly, going forward as we you know face other uh, crises like this uh, as a military person and as a person who studied uh, you know Islam and, and human rights violations uh, what what would be your advice for the prime minister uh, going forward well this is not a situation to be timid uh, uh, this is a situation in which the uh, uh, western leaders have to bring everything to the table and I mean everything to get those people out of there as quickly as possible because letting this go on for any length of time is going to be a drip drip. We think that, uh, remember the Iranian hostage crisis uh, of 1979 when they had uh, 440 odd people, uh, that drip and dripped and drabbed on for a long time. This is going to be a lot worse and it's going to be um, uh, the people that are involved on the, uh, uh, on, the, uh, on the dirty end of the stick are going to be in for horrendous treatment. Everything just has to be put on the table. You you saw the beginnings of some of these crises uh, way back uh, 2001 9/11. Uh, you want to tell our audience you were you were in a plane flying a plane when oh. uh, the twin towers came down. Do you want to? Uh, I was. Uh, that a bit? Yeah, I was uh, flying a DC nine, and I was piloting a DC nine on that particular trip. The, the pilot and the co-pilot. I was a co-pilot alternate. Uh, 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 trips and that was my trip from uh, Quebec City to Toronto. Uh, we got airborne early in the morning, uh, September 11. What a beautiful day it was! And uh, we took off, and uh, our first contact with uh, Toronto International happened about 100 miles out. And as soon as we uh, we uh, introduced ourselves to uh, Toronto uh, International, they cleared us to land. What the heck is going on here? You never get cleared to land 100 miles out from Toronto. Most times you only get cleared to land until you're on top of the runway because it's so busy there that they have to make sure the guy ahead of you is cleared off and on the taxiway. So we got cleared 100 miles out. So I look at my uh, my captain and I, I say, do you know what's going on here? He said, no. 
But uh, when we landed, uh, it was uh, the airport was something I'd never seen before. It was chock a block with heavy aircraft all over the place on the taxiways. Every gate was full. <clears throat> there were aircraft just where you never see aircraft ever. So the the, the airport was completely full, and uh, so we we taxied in. We did get a gate, and um, and we we went into the ready room, the pilot ready room. And we got there just in time to see one of the uh, Twin Towers fall. So that was uh, a striking moment. That, that struck me as, uh, uh, as a seminal moment in my, in my career, my aviation career. And from that point on, the next day, I started writing security plans for the Air Canada Pilot Association and uh, wound up uh, working with the association over the next several years, um, dealing with uh, Senate committees on air aviation security, on uh, various aspects of aviation security um, as a result. So that's where I really got into uh, the threat analysis at that point. When I, I, I noted something uh, back when I was flying fighters, uh, F-18s in the Persian Gulf War, I, I picked up on some things that I found curious. And now after 9-11, uh, I really, um, I started digging deep into Islam, read the Quran, uh, got dug into the hadith, uh, studied studied uh, Islam's prophet, uh, really tried to get a handle on what the heck was going on. Yeah. In in the last few years, you uh, have been an important voice, in my opinion, uh, in uh, the Canadian discourse on these matters, uh, security, human rights, so on. And uh, before we close, Rasa, if you could uh, tell people how to find you and uh, your information, C3RF, uh, explain a little bit about uh, uh, that organization and, and uh, what you're up to today. And uh, what, or not today, but in these days, uh, in these tough days, where of course we're at a, an election right now, uh, that's a different kettle of fish, but, uh, and, and how people can get a hold of you and uh, follow you and, and maybe help you in your uh, quest to make uh, keep can Canadian charter rights uh, protected uh, uh, in, in the days ahead. Okay, thanks very much, Rod. Uh, back when we started, back in 2017, I think we started because we were reacting against false narratives. And those false narratives have been building ever since. Uh, they've been with us and they're increasing. And now we're finding ourselves in a position where we have all these narratives about uh, uh, a virus, a pandemic, uh, so dire that we have to uh, we have to constrain and take away our civil liberties. Actually, we've actually um, been talked into a situation where we've developed a police state where police are actually picking up pastors and throwing them in the back of uh, squad cars like sides of beef. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of uh, Pastor uh, uh, Plavosky. Yeah. And we're in a situation now where we're, we're in a dire situation where the false narratives have taken over objective reality and the truth. And what we try to do at C3RF is we try to dig into the facts uh, of what's going on, get dig into the evidence, uh, dispel these false narratives, at, at least challenge them, uh, hopefully to the point where people will start thinking uh, that, you know, maybe they've got to look into these, these things themselves. Uh, especially in this election season, because what we see now, it's really scary, is we see the, um, the, the legacy political parties are all signed on to the false narratives. They, they, all, they all believe that um, this experimental vaccine that we have should be injected into children, uh, even though its long-term effects are unknown at this point in time. Yeah. Uh, they've, uh, they've got everybody scared. Uh, you know, the just today or yesterday, the uh, the Ontario government saying that if their MPPs aren't uh, inoculated, then they have to leave the party. This is becoming crazy. Yeah, this is good. crazy, crazy time. So yeah. right now, what we're involved in is we're asking uh, C3F uh, uh, members, anybody else that will listen to us, to, to look at who you vote for very, very carefully because the party system is not serving as well. It's not serving uh, the, the individual uh, citizen. Uh, the citizen is not being represented by, by the parties and it's not supposed to be that way. He's supposed to be represented by his elected representative. Yeah. And these elective rep representatives on many, many uh, occasions have simply been usurped by political powers, uh, party powers, and they're doing the party will. They're not doing the will of the people. 
Yep. So what we're asking people to do is, is be the disruptor. Vote for a person on the basis of his principles and what he believes on whether or not he'll support you and your rights in the political halls of power. We're asking people to really think hard about who they put in power. Don't worry about this party winning or that party winning, because right now we're in dire straits. We just need to get some people in, in Parliament that are prepared to work on, on the basis of, of principles and values that serve Canadians best. Oh, you, can reach us, you can reach us at uh, www.canadiancitizensplural.org. And please come on over, join us, join the conversation. Uh, we've got a lot of great people who, um, who have a lot of interesting things to say. Very good. Well, uh, Major Russ uh, Cooper, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's been uh, eye-opening, I'm sure, for many of us, uh, some of the perspectives that you have on these important international events and, of course, Canada's future. We hang in the balance. And, of course, right today, we we in the Christian Heritage Party are involved in the election campaign, and uh, we're trying to offer that alternative. Uh, we're one of the one of the groups that is trying to offer an alternative to the mainstream lockstep you know, uh, narrative, as you referred to it, on so many different topics. And uh, of course, this uh, crisis in Afghanistan is one we're all concerned about. We do pray for the people there, Canadians and Afghanis and U.S. Uh, citizens who who uh, need deliverance from this brutal tyranny. But thank you for joining thank us you. and God bless you and your work. And God bless. And I agree with everything you said and good luck in the election. Thank you. Thanks very much. Have a good day, folks. Come back next week for another edition of CHP Talks.